many technologists to say this AI thing, I don't want it to take my job. I don't want it to control what I'm thinking and how I'm doing it. I really want it to stay out of my way because I know best. My name is Alfred Ojuku. I've been at Microsoft for about 13 and a half years. I've done everything from consulting to now sales. I'd love to hear, how is your role changing? The truth is, AI isn't going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. We all have to kind of evolve together. What you realize is we're all learning. We're all getting better. We're all getting smarter. We're all getting more efficient. What are some of the things you're excited about? I, I can definitely tell you what I'm excited about because it is a game changer for me. I think one of the concerns is AI has the potential to dumb down the sales profession, right? People will always buy from those that they trust. They still are looking for that human aspect, that human connection. You have to be the trusted advisor. Really thrilled to be joined today by uh, Alfred Ojoku, who is not only an alumni of uh, SRG sales training programs, but uh, has been a really good supporter, sponsor, uh, and friend of, of SRG and now SBI over the years. And Alfred comes to us from Microsoft. I'll let him tell us a little bit more about his role and really sharing two hats that we're interested in. Uh, one is really a, a senior and very successful uh, sales professional at Microsoft, and also as a member of the, the Blacks at Microsoft, uh, and actually a co-chair of that group. And we, we're interested in kind of diving into uh, his perspective on some of those uh, items as well. But Alfred, maybe I could just have you uh, do a little deeper uh, introduction to yourself, and then we'll dive into some of our questions today. Yeah, no problem. And again, thanks, Ray, for the opportunity to, to meet with this team and uh, share a little bit about uh, who I am. Again, my name is Alfred Ojuku. I've been at Microsoft for about 13 and a half years. You know, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, I've done everything from consulting to now sales. I've been in the sales role for about eight years now. Uh, I focus primarily on surface and surface hardware. And I work a lot with healthcare customers in the healthcare industry. So we do a lot of conversations around, you know, pharmaceuticals, uh, nurses, physicians, all those fun things. Uh, as well as I'm also very involved with the employee resource groups, which is more internal to Microsoft, but focused on identifying individuals who have like causes and allow you to focus on, you know, how do we strengthen those areas around amongst those people that are looking for that strength and support. Uh, pri primarily the Black and African American community. I am what they call the, Bl the Blacks at Microsoft e uh, ERG lead or, or chair. Uh, last year I was the vice chair, uh, known as co-chair. This year I, I am the primary chair. Uh, and so what that affords me is the ability to work with a number of different local chapters from Houston to Dallas to Seattle to Florida. And we, you know, the same work. I did New York for years. We did a lot of uh, you know, uh, fundraising programs, through programs for high school students, college students, as well as opportunities to collaborate and communicate with our leadership team. I did a lot of that for a lot of that for New York, and now having the opportunity to not only do it for the U.S. chapters, but also a number of the international chapters like Ireland and South America and 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 Germany and things of that nature. So um, for me, that's a, the long and short of it. I'm sure there's a whole lot more I can share. But uh, there's excitement in that because it is a labor of love and it's also intertwined with what I do on a day-to-day -day basis with customers. Yeah, well, and I think that's what's fascinating about this. And I, I'm anxious to dive into more detail is, is you're out there with customers every day, right? And you're working with your colleagues within Microsoft and, and the, the sales organization at large um, to see how these practices are put in place and how we can improve how we, we interface and, and interact. Uh, and even through some of the ways that, that we go to market. And so what I'd love to do is kind of break this up into two parts. So let's talk a little bit about your role as a seller and bringing those solutions to your customers. And I know we were riffing a little bit on artificial intelligence and now with Copilot and Bing Chat and other things coming out. You know, how is that changing your role? And then part two, let's dig into more um, with your role as chair of, of Blacks at Microsoft and how is that coming to bear with the, the role changing and, and that sales motion? Um, so if that's okay, let's start with that first question. I'd love to hear, you know, how is your role changing? You've been a lead seller selling Surface, but I think what really struck us as we partnered with you and, and your teams that 
it's selling Surface as a solution, not as a device. Mm -hmm. And I know we spent a lot of time talking about selling at the senior level, selling it as a executive, uh, you know, solving those problems at the executive level. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how your role has changed and how you're bringing AI into that discussion. I love that question. And what I, what I, and I'm, hats off to you for remembering all of those nuances that we were working to figure out. I think that's an important element because, you know, not only were there things that you all taught us during the program, but things that we had to retain and uh, evolve over the years. You know, uh, some of it may have been somewhat new in terms of introductory at the time that I was taking the course, but many of, many of those concepts have now become staple parts of my conversation growing parts of my discussions with other CEOs, CTOs, and CIOs. But also, uh, one of the things that I love about the comparison between what I'm doing and what AI is doing is because mm -hmm. what you realize is we're all learning. We're all getting better. We're all getting smarter. We're all getting more efficient on a day-to-day -day basis on how we have conversations, how we store information, how we reuse information. So when I think about AI and its intelligence, it's almost sort of like, we are part of that growth. We may do it at a different pace and a different method and a different avenue than what AI does, but they two kind of have to run parallel alongside with each other. So for me, where I had the most growth for me was realizing that um, when I think about AI, it really calls out the need for us to be much more resilient and um, uh informed when it comes to making decisions with whether it's solutions and i'll give you an example of that you know when i'm speaking with customers when i'm talking about why they should invest in a certain solution i not only want to position the product to them i want to understand where their challenges are what other products are looking at what is what's the most important thing for them what's keeping them up at night you know what you know how does it affect them their family members their relatives their neighbors right so so it almost sort of encompasses not just the device but the their ecosystem everything about them because that's how you're going to understand how you can position what they need to do or what they don't need to do when it comes to technology and the beauty of that is when you think about ai it's giving you sort of that extra umph to figure out all these other ex, ex, you know uh, extracurricular extracurricular activities around who am i working with what is this organization talking about? How can I be more efficient in my conversations? So over the years, that's what you've seen, I've seen happen. And not only for me to do it, but also to share it with my teams, my colleagues, and uh, anyone that's on my, on my account teams that's even selling, you know, parallel products to an, an, organ, an organization. Um, it takes time, but it's, it's that adaptability that's important in what we do and understanding that AI isn't going anywhere. We're right. not going anywhere. We all have to kind of evolve together. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. And and not surprising, I think we see this very similar that the promise for me is that AI actually helps improve our sales motion, right? And improve uh, our the work we do as sales professionals, not just automating uh, what we do or, or outsourcing, right? It's like, oh, it's going to take over. Um, in fact, I think that's one of the concerns is we can automate bad process where we can just create more spam and more noise um, if, if we're not taking time to really use it thoughtfully. But I've even heard Satya Nadella, right, the Microsoft CEO, talk about the promise is really it can offload some of those tasks that are mundane and repetitive, but free us up to be more creative, right, and more customer centric. And I think that's a great promise for the future is, hey, it really actually enables us to be, to be more successful. Um, so no, not, not surprising. We, we see that very similar. I'm, I'm curious as you are on the inside and I know some things you probably can't talk about, but what are some of the things you're excited about? I know you've taken your own courses and kind of staying up on the market, but where AI is evolving. And when we think about Copilot now being released to the, the general public and, uh, you know, Bing chat and, and other tools, what are you excited about that you've seen and, and seen in practice? Well, I, I can definitely tell you what I'm excited about it. And there's no, there's nothing to hide about it because it is a, it's a game changer for me, right? I can go, I can go back four or five years ago that, you know, one of the things that I was passionate about and some of the people internal at Microsoft that I work with on my teams and that I lead uh, weren't always excited because every time we had a meeting, guess what I did, Ray? I said, we need to record this call. We need to get to make sure we capture the information. 
And the, the pushback that I got a lot of times was, well, we'll never go back and watch it. We'll never go back and listen to it, which I understood, right? Mm-hmm. And the truth is, if we didn't really need to go back and watch it, then we can just delete it or allow the system to delete it, which is what usually happens. But the beauty of that is that as we kind of evolved into where we are now, the way that tools like Copilot work, um, which is our you know, AI solution built into Teams and you know M365, is that it's able to now take those transcripts of information, even if we're on this call, and analyze it and summarize our conversation in terms of what you and I spoke about today and give you a a spit back sort of a logical approach of all the things we talked about. Now, what's also interesting about that is that prior to this, I would have been trying to find our recording, Ray. I'd have been trying to sit down and listen to what were the key points that Ray mentioned? What were the key points that Alfred mentioned? Which ones were important? How do I identify what what the go-to actions are? And, you know, who's going to be scheduling the next follow-up call? And these are all tasks that we typically routinely are asked to do and figure out. What I love about AOPilot is that's going to save you two hours, three hours worth of, you know, um, uh, postulating on how do I get this done? And if you add up the number of meetings you have a day times six, seven, eight, that's over, you know, eight, you know, 10 hours saved for you. And you can spend that time working on something else. You provide the notes to those individuals and you can move forward. So that's one example of just being able to get more done with the tools that we have. Another one that's amazing now is I'm starting to see is PowerPoint, where you have the ability to use Copilot to help you generate a PowerPoint presentation based on some concepts, some ideas and suggestions that you might suggest in a specific set of files. Create a PowerPoint about my, you know, my new car that I want to position to you know, sell back to, you know, the Jeep Grand Cherokee and, and Chrysler and get a new, and it'll basically write it out for you based on what your options are. It'll find images for you and you can essentially use it to as a starting point to really kind of position what is it that I want to share with my investors or the person that's looking to purchase the car, right? That's just those simple ideas. And imagine as we integrate it more into everything we talk about, as you mentioned, Satya mentioned those mundane tasks. Those aren't necessarily mundane tasks. They are actually critical tasks to getting work done. But we spend so much time doing it that it takes away from the goal of our projects. So, I see that as sort of the future of how we do business, how we do sales, how we do everyday planning. Whether you want to go on a trip to Jamaica or Fiji, you can literally plan out what you want to do by using these tools and it'll save you hours, if not days. Absolutely. And as you said, you know, frees us up to do better research or better align with what the customer is asking for or, you know, go after new new strategic pursuits. And, and so that time can be more spent on those high value activities, right? That as sales professionals, uh, that only we can do. But, mm-hmm. you know, you, you used an interesting phrase in there and it keyed in on it, which was it gives you a great starting point. And so, you know, when you talk about it creating a PowerPoint outline, I think when I get the feedback and people say, Oh, well, you know, I, I've tried it, but it's not very good or, you know, it, it missed the mark or I can't trust it. And it's like, you're maybe not asking the question right. And, and not leveraging it. So I think it's an iterative process and, and to use it as a starting point, as you said, and then say, Oh, well, here, I actually need to refine this. Or can you give me another shot? You know, give me three more examples and build it out. Now you're using it like a brainstorming partner or, or a mentor. And it can be very successful then to get to a better output. But if you just want to use it like Bing and it's like, oh, give me the answer. Um, you know, it may not be, that's not what it was designed to do. And it's an iterative, an iterative tool. I think that was a really good distinction. Yeah. I, that's again, the word copilot is just, um, absolutely phenomenal word because what it tells you is that this tool isn't doing the work for you. It's doing with you. It's working alongside to figure out what you're looking for, giving you suggestions and allowing you to still have that creative power to say, you know what? I don't like any of this or wow, this is great. I'm going to use 60%, 70%, 80%. And you get to decide that. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. And the other one I I was just playing around with, but uh, I had a a short PowerPoint, turned it into a PDF, had in this case, chat GPT, but, but had AI look at it and give me recommendations. 
uh, for how I could improve that based on the persona. I told him who I was calling on, what the meeting, who was going to be there. And it came back and it was very insightful. I mean, it was like, well, you might shore up your case studies around this particular area because they're in this industry and you might strengthen your value proposition by actually quantifying. I mean, it was fantastic. And I was like, okay, I, those are a couple of things I can act on right now, right? Making, making it a better conversation. Um, so I, I want to continue on that thread a little bit and, and talk about how, you know, training and enablement, um, and, and really helping the sellers. How do we need to evolve thinking about that motion to make, you know, the sales profession more effective using some of these tools and technology? Great question again. I think, uh, the, um, it, it's the, it, when I think about what AI is bringing to the industry is, a need for embracing what it's capable of doing. And mm -hmm. you and I spoke earlier, one of the things that I said seems to be happening is there's sort of this standoffish approach for many sellers, for many technologists to say, this AI thing, I don't want it to take my job. I don't want it to control what I'm thinking and how I'm doing it. I really want it to stay out of my way because I know best. Versus embraces, bracing the, 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 um, the and, you know, the ability to work with it. I can do my work and I can integrate it with AI and understanding that it could be the thing that helps you be more productive. And it's really just a paradigm shift of not necessarily looking at it as a negative, but rather a possibility of limitless capabilities. Um, as long as it's being used for the right cause. Now, the other way to look at it too is I don't have to embrace all of it. I can embrace what I need, use what I need, evaluate what I need, and then use that to make smarter, much more intelligent decisions. So it still remains there. It's kind of that, that, that friend that you go and check in every once in a while, like, you know, Hey, you know, Tom, should I go to this or not? He'll tell you, no, don't go to it. But guess what? You're probably going to that party anyways, you know? <laughs> you know, you're going to that event, but you just want to make sure that you heard their opinion before you made that decision. And that's how I think about Copilot. It's a friend that's there for you to use it and help you make more logical decisions. Yeah, well, I think it's really powerful to think about it as helping to change that mindset and the way we interact with it versus just giving you a playbook and saying, well, here are all the prompts you need, you know, go put this into your process. And then they come back and go, ah, it didn't really work, or I, mm -hmm. I forgot to use it, or I don't know. I mean, I think we really need to engage and see how powerful it can be if you go, you know, have it define the personas for a particular pursuit within a specific industry and help you craft your solution. You're like, oh, now I get it. That, that mm -hmm. might be helpful. I should probably do that. And yeah, I think that that's really important. Let's talk about the negative side for a little bit. Um, you know, and, and you kind of started off when we were talking earlier about that of, well, you know, is it accurate and is it giving us good information? So I think one of the concerns is AI has the potential to dumb down the sales profession, right? To, to make us complacent, maybe make it too easy. Oh, I'll take that answer. I'll put it into an email, uh, and, and not validate it and, and not really being able to trust it. How do we avoid some of those things? I mean, how do we make sure that we're still keeping a high standard and, and that we're engaging with the client, you know, as a human? I love that. Again, they're all great questions. What, what I'll always say and what I'll, I think I will always reiterate is, and this goes back to the whole sales conversation that we had in the course and what I've mm -hmm. learned over the years is people will always buy from those that they trust. They, 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 they still, are looking for that human aspect, that human connection. You know, we talk about the speed of trust. The more someone trusts that what you're bringing is going to help them do a, you know, be better at their business, to be more efficient, the easier it is for them to commit to you what they're willing to do to change their ability to, to impact their business. So that trust is first and foremost. And if you're able to provide them much more intelligent, much more informed information, informed details about what they need, there, that's going to help build the trust. Now, where AI and partnering with AI does that is if I'm getting the right information from it and I'm using it responsive, responsibly to analyze what my customer needs, then it becomes a relationship that is driven based on 
I am helping you find data. I am helping you find data points that's good for you. However, if it's being used in in sort of in a combative way or, well, um, I don't want to spend the time doing the research and talking to the individuals at the company, understanding how they use it. I'm just doing what I find in the, I'm only using it to just find data on, on the web, which is what this, this, these tools are doing. They're searching the web for information. The fact that there might be inaccurate or on, um, uh, you know, less than accurate information out there, that could creep into these conversations where the business knows that that information may not be accurate and you're presenting it to them because you haven't done your work. Right. So that human aspect still matters. That human discussion is a very vital part of your relationship with that customer because that's what they're after not the bot the bot or the ai or the tool right. but the fact that you're able to connect with them at a personal level and give them advice and i always call it you have to be the trusted advisor they have to feel like you're going to give them the most relevant information they don't care where you get it from as long as it's correct right <laughs> you know well and it may make that even more important right that to the extent that we're automating some of it or we're speeding up that process but then the human element becomes that much more important and they have to be able to trust that when they're talking to Alfred, we know that he's got the goods and he's given us the real, the real truth here. Right. Correct. Correct. Yeah, that's great. Are you doing anything else to protect from, you know, bias or hallucinations or, you know, some of those other, I, I guess, you know, newsflash, everything on the internet isn't a hundred percent accurate. So if it's mm -hmm. pulling from that information, the results it may produce may not be a hundred percent accurate, but is there anything else we can do to protect from that? This is a long going challenge. It's, it's, this isn't a new thing. It's been going on for hundreds of years. Let's just be honest, right? It's, it, it's, it's now seeping into our technology. It's now seeping into AI. Um, we know it. We realize it. And, uh, the, the bigger challenge, I think, is that, you know, sometimes we feel as individuals that our input won't affect the outcome of the solution because who am I? to state something? Who am I to step in and add my detail? Who am I to learn how to do coding or algorithmic writing? Um, and the truth is, we need as many people to get involved with the back end as well as the front end usage of the tool. And part of my mission is to increase the number of individuals coming from diverse backgrounds to get involved with building these engines, to get involved with evaluating these engines, to get involved with making, helping it make much more informed decisions so that it isn't biased when it's pulled out of the, the data source. That's a lot of work. And it's going to take a lot of time because when we get into the idea of responsible AI, it's really making sure that the data that's back there, somebody is reviewing it to make sure that it's being pulled and that it's accurate. That to me is probably the number one challenge I think we're going to have because as quickly as AI continues to evolve, will be just as quick as it's going to be to try to change it, right? It's not, it's not going to slow down. So the more people we get involved, the more input we get, the more feedback we get from people that are both building it and analyzing the data and correcting it, the better off we're going to be. But we've got a long ways to go. Yeah, well, and I think as that emerges, and especially with tools like Copilot, where we can train it on our own company information, right? So we're not relying on whatever it had, what it was trained on mm -hmm. or it can find, but now we know, oh, it knows our playbook. It knows our customer case studies. It knows our sales process. Um, now I think you can, you can trust that a lot more and inheriting the Azure security model and everything else. It sounds like, well, now I actually have a trusted environment where I can leverage, you know, Bing chat or, or copilot within that, right? Agreed. Agreed. I, I think that'll, that'll be exciting. Well, hey, I want to shift to part two because um, I think this will all be relevant. But, you know, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more and, and you opened with that, but talk a little bit more about your role as chair of, of Blacks at Microsoft. And then specifically, you know, we started talking about, well, there's some bias and other things we should be considered. But how should we think about that with respect to sales enablement professionals and as we're going to market and training our sales teams, can you share some examples? It doesn't have to even be with Microsoft, but that you're seeing within the industry and the clients, how should we be thinking about this and, and in terms of the role and, and function you play at Microsoft? Great question. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of go backwards and say, again, I've been at Microsoft for a little over a decade now. Um, it, like I said, time flies. I yep. love every minute of it. I've learned a lot along the way. 
Uh, one thing that I will say is that, you know, companies like Microsoft will continue to evolve. Um, they'll continue to adapt. They'll continue to learn from how to be more agile in terms of making decisions. One of those technologies that Microsoft and especially specifically Satya as a leader uh, took on is to integrate the conversation around AI, Denali, and all the tools that are being used today to drive uh, innovation, to drive, drive automation. Um, one of the challenges with that is um, many of the roles that one would consider more um, uh, more driven by auto, not, not necessarily automation, but task driven roles mm -hmm. where you do X, Y, Z probably needed to be re redesigned or re, re envisioned. And so what we saw was a need for individuals to also reimagine what they would like to do because the roles that were now being required had a expectation that you have an understanding of what AI is and how it's being used as we build the cloud you know the, they're looking for people that have an understanding of the AI space as as it goes into the cloud as we build security we're looking for people that have an understanding of how AI works and so as a, a leader within the blacks and Microsoft space I've had to look at the population of individuals here and challenge them and say you know what you've been doing this work for a while you're really good at it but if you're going to stay and continue to grow with this team and evolve yourself, you're going to have to pick up some of these new skills. You're going to have to spend some time getting certified in AI 900 and AZ 900. You're going to have to understand how to use chat GPT and Bing, Bing AI to make your, your conversations. You're going to have to be able to tell the story around Copilot. And that also goes along with the sales team because even again, I'm going to use example for surface. I'm specifically in surface hardware. I can't have a conversation around Surface without bringing in what Microsoft is doing as it pertains to using AI technologies within the chipset. Good example is if you look at this camera, you can see the blur that's happening behind the scenes. That's being driven by a chipset on the device that says, you focus on the individual, but blur everything else out, but don't use all the processes. Don't use all the resources on the device. So now the device is much smarter. It knows how to pull that data from the small chipset but also blur everything else out, fix the, the, the imagery. Um, and that's because they redesigned the chipset. So that's just one example of where it now has become part of my conversation when it comes to customers and showing them the value of AI and how it can actually help them achieve simple goals without having to think about it. Think about all the other product stacks that have something that, that is integrated with AI. And all of these individuals that are in roles today that are doing a great job and they love what they do, they're going to have to reinvent themselves. My challenge is to help them do that. My challenge is just to show them the path on how to get that. My challenge is to provide options internally that says, here's the courses you can take to make sure you are at level 200, 300, 400. Go. That's fantastic. So, uh, yeah, I love the, here's the opportunity ahead of us that you can maybe expose or evangelize, right? Make make that available. It strikes me though that also on the other side, and I think for for some of our other companies and, and clients listening, thinking about what can the company do to get ahead of that, right? Because they need to make those opportunities available and invest and make the training programs available, right? Because we probably can't find enough people to do that new skill set anyway, because they just don't exist. So let's make them from the pool that we have or the pool that we want to draw from to have a more diverse uh, workforce, right? And to be able to represent different factions as we're, we're coming together. So I think that's really interesting. And I'm sure there are other initiatives going on to make sure those opportunities are available within Microsoft, right? Yeah. I mean, I think it, the challenge itself, I mean, there's, there's, um, I think one thing that Microsoft, not just Microsoft, but many companies have built in is the reward system. Right. I, if you ever watch LinkedIn, one of the things I, I, I wasn't a huge fan about of mm -hmm. when it first came out, but was, you know, badges, you know, reward systems that I can say, look, I just got a badge and it's an Azure fundamentals. And everyone says, kudos, 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 kudos. And it almost sort of builds the emotional, um, support of why I do what I do. And not only reinforces to others that, Hey, this person is credible. He knows what he's doing. He's serious about what he wants to do. And so that reward system is something that we, I almost want to say dangle in front of people and say, get your reward. 
for what your what, what your work you're doing. People will respect you for it, and so it's a way of encouraging others to reskill themselves and stay ahead of the trend. No, that's great, and I think I mean we found it in our programs having the whether LinkedIn or a Credly badge or whatever that is that says you've completed this, like you've you've mastered this component or this program to these standards, whatever they are, it is motivating. And and people like that, they see it, and we should give them that path, I think, to, to build those skills that are aligned with where the organization needs to go and, yep. and support that. So no, that that's great. Well, can you talk a little bit about how do we help the sales managers and sales leaders and leaders within the organization, I guess, embrace this as well, and especially in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, right? To make that one to acknowledge it, and then also to make those opportunities available to their team. So that's um. I mean, that could be a whole other podcast, but <laughs> it's a whole other exactly a whole other podcast. Um, I think it's a joint effort. I know I'll say that uh, out of respect. I think number one is is ref- you have to understand that there is a need for introducing the conversation around diversity in product in the communication in the in the roles uh you know a good example i'll give you a great example is um you know i had a colleague that worked a lot in the inner cities um and in the inner cities what you found when you went to speak with the students the high school students the elementary school students were there were a lot of kids from underrepresented neighborhoods black and brown students that were looking for education and so when you had someone that uh, didn't have that same background or didn't, you know, understand where they're coming from. And they had the conversation with these students. They were less likely to connect with those students because they didn't, un- they, they, they couldn't relate to those relationships. When someone of, you know, of, you know, from that neighborhood or grew up in that neighborhood or came out of that environment could walk in there and they could see themselves in that individual, there was a, there was a more of a connection of saying, I can actually do this. I'm willing to invest in this, not just for that the child, that student, but also for the guidance counselor, for and also for the you know the 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 the, the principal, anybody that's involved in that education to say, I see where those connections happen. So from our standpoint, when you come in with a diverse attitude around connecting with different people from different cultures, you might you you will most likely be able to build stronger relationships and stronger trust between your organization and the people that you service. And that's something that we're having to learn is how do we give them a more diverse, an understanding that we are a diverse organization and that we are out here to serve anyone and everyone. And the one way to do that is you have to have the diversity built into your organization to begin with, you know? So. Yeah. You have to, have to represent and seeing the benefits of what diversity brings right to the Mm -hmm. organization. I mean, that, now we can look at a diversity of opinions and a diversity of perspectives and, and build better products, right? And, and better solutions. Uh, the other piece I'll mention too, Ray, is um, the reason why that's important is because society have, has, have established biases from years of expectations of what individuals might look like, behave like. Um, the neighborhoods they come from, the education they have, you know, the, the, the things that they do, the way they speak, all these biases are opinions that essentially um, shape what they think about an organization or an individual. And we've got to figure out ways to erase those biases because what we're starting to learn is it doesn't matter. No, many of those things don't really matter because once you learn about, you know, someone helping you solve a business problem or that, you know, whether or not they grew up in the same neighborhood as you that may not make any difference because they're helping you close the deal because they understand what you need, right. you know? And, and so that bias has to essentially, we've got to figure out a way to bring those walls down. And part of that, and I love working with some of my teammates is when I jump into a meeting or when we, you know, we used to jump into a meeting, they immediately start by providing the credentials. This person does this, and this is how his background, this is what he's focused on. It automatically erases any, Prejudgment that someone might have about what you're bringing to the table, and it and allows you to kind of have much more meaningful conversations. It's like almost like taking the kryptonite out of the room and saying, "Let's have a conversation about how we can save you." You know, so sure. 
And, and, you know, hopefully there's a world where we, we don't have to level the playing field, right? It's just, you are who you are. Right. And, and that's where we start, but, but I think it's good. And, and sometimes we do need to call attention to it and get it out there and then say, all right, well, let's lean in. And I think having those one-on-one experiences is where it really comes to life. Right. And people are like, oh yeah, it, it you know, it doesn't matter who we're working with or, um, this is, you know, an exceptionally talented team and it doesn't matter what the makeup is, but, um, you know, that, that takes being there and having that experience for yourself oftentimes and seeing it, like you said, who shows up, uh, to give the presentation. I think it really does matter. Yep. And also making sure you have like a game plan going in, right? So teams can be diverse and may, may not really understand who's who and what's what on the team. But if you set up some time beforehand and say, Hey, let's talk about what our plan is. Let's talk about our approach. Let's talk about who we want to connect with. You know, what we're going to ask for. How do we want to end the conversation? That pre-gaming with a customer or with your team will help you get to a better state because you go, you're going in knowing what to expect from each player on that team. Um, and to me, that's also important, right? If you want to win the championship, you go in with a game plan. Right. Right. Which is just good team selling and, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah, just a good good approach overall. So, well, and and I know we uh, we kind of did it, took a left turn or did a deeper dive into that, which is great. I mean, fantastic discussion. Um, I'd love to see if you could just sum up for us and there one or two things you you could leave our audience with. You know, either related to AI and and the piece that you're excited about, and then specifically in terms of the role. You know, how we sh- how we should think about that um, in terms of your role. You know, blacks at Microsoft and and diversity as well. Uh, I think, and thank you, Ray. I'm, I'm going to actually pivot it just a little bit because I think for me, uh, one of the biggest, um, the biggest growths I've had in the last two years is understanding what it means to be more of a leader. Um, you know, when I say leader, I think there are many types of leaders within organizations that drive different needs. I, I mean, for me, from a very organic level, understanding how to enable people to do more enable people to become leaders and lead other people and understanding that that influence is what changes, you know, your environment. So as, as a leader in the blacks of Microsoft uh, team, one of the most powerful things I've learned is to understand that my influence to my colleagues, my cohorts um, and the people that I work with is so much more powerful when they understand the vision and they understand what we're after. And they, they, they understand that their success is just as important as my success. And if they are, aren't clear on that vision, they should be coming back, sitting down and talking through how to get there. That to me is a big part of this whole mission. So, you know, I've integrated AI into all of our conversations, whether it's in the sales role or in the blacks at Microsoft or in the community role. And I'm looking for people that are passionate to drive that initiative forward in their day jobs, as well as their uh, goals to drive diversity, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion within Microsoft. And to me, that's the most powerful thing is because that giving for me helps me know that I'm doing all the right things. When you have people that reach out and say, thank you, reach out and say, because of you, I now have a new opportunity, a new role. Because of you, I've moved up one or two levels at Microsoft or any company. Because of you, I feel more confident that I can close a deal with a customer. And that's the beauty of why I do what I do. And again, I, I'm always super excited to have this conversation because sometimes it gets bottled, bottled in, but sharing it with someone like you and the rest of the team is what it's all about. Well, I think that's a fantastic place to wrap up. And uh, it is really inspirational to see what you've done as a leader and driving within Microsoft as a top seller, as a leader, um, you know, championing the, the, these new areas. And, uh, you know, not not surprising that, that you're doing that well and uh, hope you uh, continued success in, in both of those roles. Thank you. Thank you.